every company has a TAM, a target addressable market size. They know exactly what it is. What most don't know is the serviceable addressable market. So Canalis, for example, uh, the firm I work for, works on the splits. How much of your TAM is direct? How much of it is indirect in the resale model? How much of it is marketplace? What are the growth rates on each one? And basically serving your buyer or your prospective buyer, you want to create a frictionless environment. If they're going to buy through a marketplace, which increasingly 86% growth year over year, they are. If you stay off of marketplaces for every year you do that, your market SAM drops because the remaining routes to market and go to market are not growing as fast as marketplaces. Our sponsor is Partner Insight your AI co-pilot to grow your partnerships 3x faster. Onboard and collaborate with partners from one shared platform. Seamlessly exchange and track deals, content, and data. Use AI to automate engagements, track progress, create reports, or answer frequent partner questions. Try Partner Insight for free. Hi, Jay. One of the best time of, of my day when I want to have a conversation with you. Thank you so much for having me again. A lot of things happening since we spoke last time, uh, you know, a couple of months ago. Today, I would love us to, to, to double down on new things. First of all, marketplaces are growing very quickly and you, you, you've been covering them, uh, doing like sort of very detailed breakdown. So marketplace is number one. And then AI is, seems to be changing partnership landscape or about to change partnership landscape. I, will, I would love us to talk a little, a little bit more about that. Another interesting thing is that last time we spoke going into recession, now we are, seems to be in, in the midst of it. I would love us uh, to, to talk about sort of updates, what, what's been happening uh, across partnership teams and inter Tech, tech companies today. But let, let's start with marketplaces. So AWS, Google Cloud, uh, and Microsoft Cloud, they, they all put marketplaces in the center of the go-to-market strategy. Tell us a little bit more what, you, what you've seen. Yeah, there's two kind of wide-ranging predictions on marketplaces. One at the very top, B2B marketplaces, business-to-business -business marketplaces. McKinsey made a report that said $17 trillion with a T will flow through B2B marketplaces by 2030. And last year's world economy was 94 trillion. So this just shows you the, the size and scale of that prediction, which is wrong, probably in orders of magnitude wrong. But the fact that we're talking about marketplaces in tens of trillions of dollars makes it interesting. Uh, to roll it back a little bit, to talk about cloud marketplaces, the, the ones you just mentioned, which are AWS, Microsoft, Google, our Salesforce, ServiceNow, Workday, Marketo, NetSuite, or IBM, SAP, Oracle, et cetera we're predicting $45 billion in less than two years. It represents 86% compounded growth, looking backwards, looking forwards. And we're at a point now where we're predicting AWS will be a top 10 global distributor in that same time period, which is less than two years from now. We have big security companies now saying that AWS is their largest distributor in the world after working with distribution for over 30 years. So this is accelerating quickly. We have many companies with 600% year over year growth rates in this route to market. And for the customer, a place to procure and provision, a place to buy up enterprise credits and further discounting, governance, compliance, uh, financial people like it. There's a, just a, seems to be a surge of interest and activity around this space. In one of your talks, you predicted that it's gonna be 20, largest cloud marketplaces, like taking sort of 80% of, 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 of all activities. Tell us a little more about it's like winners and losers. Who, who do you think are gonna be winners? Yeah, so a marketplace is something with scale. Uh, it's very difficult because the average buyer is gonna buy seven things. The average infrastructure deal through AWS, for example, has seven layers. The average SaaS deal through Salesforce or HubSpot, ServiceNow has seven layers. The average security deal today has seven layers. So when you get into the permutations, for example, in security, there's 4,300 security companies. So how do you build a marketplace with enough depth and breadth to handle that long tail? This is what makes Amazon, uh, from a consumer marketplace perspective, so powerful in the power of its long tail merchants. So this is, will make the largest of marketplaces more powerful in that a customer will find all seven layers, including the services, which there's over $6 of services that go with every cloud dollar, 
and allow that to procure and provision all in one place. And the long-term maintenance of that, adding a user, taking away a user, managing the rogue and shadow IT costs of the past will all be in one place. And so I mentioned a bunch of the marketplaces that uh, will make up the top 20. And those top 20 marketplaces will probably cover 80% of that 45 billion that I mentioned. The other 20%, I published a, a slide a week or so back on LinkedIn showing seven layers of competition. You know, you got the major distributors like TD Cynix and Ingram, either building in TD Cynix sense or buying Ingram, Cloud Blue, their own marketplaces. You've got major CSPs in the old Microsoft sense. Uh, now, you know, big distributors in themselves, like a Pax8, for example, or SureWeb that are building marketplaces. You've got big telco master agents, now tech solution brokers, building marketplaces. But you've got a whole industry of 150 marketplace development firms, companies like AppDirect, companies like Marketplace, or companies like Miracle in Europe that are raising billions and billions of private equity dollars that are all competing. All seven of these layers are going to compete for the other 20%. But if you're like a tech analyst, right, uh, and you, you, you're looking at this sort of happening, I'm personally wondering if like AWS will become sort of like Amazon of software, right? Is it, is it, do they think it's going to be a similar dynamic? We will we, we like all this, you know, big high hyperscalers and just like 20 winners. Will they entirely sort of redefine how um, software is sort of built and sold? Well, there's a center of gravity that comes with size and scale. So Amazon from the consumer side made every company in the world that sells products discuss it in the boardroom. So if you sell tractors, if you sell garden equipment, if you sell generators, a bolt to the side of your house, they've all in the boardroom had that go-to-market conversation. Should we buy up a showroom inside Amazon? Should we allow our resellers, wholesalers, distributors to sell through Amazon? What's the risk of doing that, which there are a lot? What's the risk of not doing that, which there's a lot of risk in not doing that? So... When that happens, there's just an economies of scale that happens. On the software side, you've got 200,000 ISVs. There's a gravity effect that you can't go and get into marketplaces that easily. The 17th fastest growing company in the world, growing at 8,000%, is Tackle.io. And that's a firm that helps you get on marketplaces. So kind of you can outsource that piece. When I ran a startup, it took me six months to get on the App Exchange. And I had to take some of my best developers and data scientists off the product to go and jump through the security hurdles to do that. So in the idea that, you know, can I go get on 20 marketplaces? Well, no, it could take you five years to go do that. So you're going to select, am I going to go get on AWS or Microsoft? Or am I going to go get on a small little local industry specific product specific marketplace? Well, I'm probably going to jump through those hoops at the top first. Make sure the most eyeballs, the biggest part of my market, TAM, I want to service that TAM in the places where the dollars are going. And that means that every software, hardware, and services company in the world, which are millions of companies, are going to have this boardroom conversation. It's happening now. Whether, you know, when and how do they execute you know, one of these top 20 marketplaces and multiple of the top 20s. If, if you're a software company and you're thinking about marketplace, it may require like realignment of your uh, partnership function, right? So you need to create like an expertise inside and uh, to create sort of almost like a mirroring of um, different people who would work together with all these hyper hyperscalers. And, and at the same time, even if you list on marketplace, it doesn't necessarily mean that tomorrow you will generate Sort of return it's like a mid to long-term strategy at least at this point do you advise sort of growth stage companies not necessarily like huge companies like palo alto for example uh who are talking about aws a lot uh, do you advise growth stage companies to focus on marketplace today rather than tomorrow the places take a different skill and it breaks up into three components one is obviously you got to get listed and listed properly with all the words and pixels and videos and everything in the right spot. 
Second, you have to win the SEO battle. So with that many billions of dollars, $45 billion going through marketplaces, that's going to start with a search. And if somebody searches a term with keywords somewhat related to you, you have to win that Google kind of SEO battle of getting on page one of the marketplace SEO. And then third, and this is the one that's missed by most, is there's a community play. Winning in the AWS marketplace with all of the AWS employees, sellers, with all of the ecosystem partners, which are over 120,000 today, is completely different than winning in Microsoft's ecosystem, which has 470,000 partners, 400 new ones joining every single day, and a completely different community. So how you get in and do all the guerrilla marketing and do all the grassroots, bottoms up marketing possible to draw people into your marketplace listing changes from marketplace to marketplace. And these are the three skills that are required at winning in marketplaces. So that's kind of number one. There's, there's kind of, um, kind of actionable things to, to get that listing properly. But your question though, is you have to be where your buyers are and every company has a TAM a target addressable market size. They know exactly what it is. What most don't know is the serviceable addressable market. So Canalis, for example, uh, the firm I work for, works on the splits. How much of your TAM is direct? How much of it is indirect in the resale model? How much of it is marketplace? What are the growth rates on each one? And basically serving your buyer or your prospective buyer, you wanna create a frictionless environment. If they're going to buy through a marketplace, which increasingly 86% growth year over year, they are. If you stay off of marketplaces for every year you do that, your market SAM drops because the remaining routes to market and go to market are not growing as fast as marketplaces. So in the end, companies have to think less about or care less about how money changes hands, especially in a subscription consumption model, which 76% of companies are going towards, you know, it's every 30 days, but whether they buy it from some sort of reseller through distribution or, or direct, if they buy it through a direct function on your own marketplace, for example, or if they buy it from a AWS or a Salesforce app exchange, it probably shouldn't matter to you because then you need to walk your program, which has a hundred elements to it. The ways that you educate and train and certify and build competencies with your partners the way you incent them and motivate them and drive loyalty, the way you co-sell and co-market with them, all of these hundred elements are now being built into marketplaces. So you could actually lift your program and move it into these major marketplaces and deploy your program just as you would through normal indirect sales. What's interesting is Microsoft led the way and dropped marketplace fees from 20% down to three. Google, Amazon, they all followed. Uh, the SaaS companies aren't there yet, but with the gross to nets or the economics of marketplaces changing so dramatically, you can actually use your front and back end margins as normal, split out a little bit of it for the marketplace fees, and still execute a really robust channel program, whether it goes through distribution, whether it goes through a marketplace, uh, or whether it's partner assist and it goes direct you can still execute. And Marketplace is just one more place that creates a frictionless buying experience for your customer. Just to, to comment on what you said about advertising, I don't know if you've seen numbers, Amazon advertising is just going through the roof and it's, it's sort of on, on not AWS, but Amazon.com, right? Uh, and probably the same model will be applied eventually with, with SaaS. And uh, I agree with you, it's, 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 it's going to be different play. But, but uh, I loved one of your comments in one of your talks comparing AWS with Microsoft, how Microsoft catching up with AWS because Microsoft has much stronger partner community comparing with AWS. So um, can you talk a little bit more about AI, which is, seems to be like a watershed moment. And uh, we just had a talk with, um, uh, VP of product in Salesforce, who is working in partner, partner management. Uh, uh, and um, we, we, we spoke about AI, but you observe the entire space. Would love to hear your opinion, how AI would change partnerships. I've been in the industry 30 years. So I've been able to follow AI for 30 years. 
I was a futurist at IBM in the mid nineties when the company, and I was representing, you know, talking to kids and talking out in public and on TV about Deep Blue, an AI system that was built to beat Gary Kasparov at chess. And it was the first time a computer had ever defeated a grandmaster. And that was a watershed moment. And then other games followed where humans cannot defeat computers anymore in games for the simple reason of brute force. It wasn't better at thinking three moves ahead. It could think every move ahead. It could play the game out in every permutation, trillions of permutations, and do that within a split second for its next move and work the game backwards from the end on every possible move and then just choose the best move each time. There's no way a human can do that. Even a grandmaster can only move ahead, look ahead maybe three moves. So then moving on to Jeopardy, how do you defeat Jeopardy champions as a computer? Well, when somebody reads the question, you've got to build the context and then build a really strong search engine and go read the internet cover to cover. It's like doing a Google search and then reading all the top 20 links and contextualizing them and having some sort of algorithm that ranks based on scoring how confident you are in the answer. And if that confidence is, let's say, 90 percent, Within a split second, you have to press the button and answer, you know, Alex Trebek. So then the computer showed in AI at that, say, that was 10 years ago, that you can defeat humans in contextual language. And I think finally, from a consumer perspective, ChatGPT has shown us that every entry level job coming out of college, whether you're an analyst like me, whether you're a paralegal, whether you're a junior accountant, it doesn't matter what you took in college. The engine behind ChatGPT can compete with you for that first job. They can pass tests at Harvard. They can apply and get into major you know, uh, business schools. They can get a job at Google already. And I think it proves to consumers where we are. But I think the best thinking about it right now by any company uh, is Microsoft. And, you know, they spent $10, $10 billion, uh, you know, investing in ChatGPT, um, which makes a total of 13, uh, which is money they put in. But they're calling it Copilot. Think of ChatGPT as your digital twin. And in partnering, you're going to have a digital twin. And so I don't want to go to your partner portal and I don't want to go and read, you know, all the stuff, terms and conditions and stuff. I want my chat GPT digital twin to go do that. And in 30 seconds or less, whether I prefer it, tell me, prefer it, you know, writes it for me or whichever way I can, you know, best understand, summarize 50 pages of small print in 30 seconds. Then I want it to go look at your program and I'm going to go ask it to look at your 10 competitors and break it down in 30 seconds who I should partner with. It's going to absorb the internet cover to cover and come back as a recommender, as a co-pilot. But in everything we do, you know, it's going to be in your email. And before I open an email, the end of security, you know, phishing and malware and stuff is when I can read my email, go click on every link and do the full analysis. And not until it's contextualized that it's safe, will it put it into my inbox. And, you know, the same goes for every other tool I use, whether it's Salesforce or whether it's uh, anything else. So my life is going to be run as a co-pilot and all the stuff that I would waste time in doing, I'll have my digital twin go and do it for me. Like how many times have you seen a business book and would you love to just send, you know, your digital twin to go read that book for you and just break it all down into like kind of a 30 second summary. Yeah. So it changes everything. It changes the way we write. It changes the way we think. And it changes the way we partner going forward. And companies are going to have to get smart in terms of how they create AI-friendly content and how they compete in the responses that ChatGPT, it's another version of SEO. Like Google is going to use backlinks and going to rank your you know, content based on a bunch of things that are really, really smart. Great way to navigate the internet, much better than Yahoo did trying to create a tree, a hierarchy of the internet. But the next version of Google search is really 
having ChatGPT not only getting those top 20, 30, 40 responses like the Jeopardy question, but condensing it within a microsecond, clicking the button and in my ear or in my text in 30 seconds, condensing volumes and volumes and volumes of information to get me to the right answer. This is basically two different archetypes how big companies engage with AI, right? This is Microsoft, which was surprisingly bold. They, they, they sort of went all in, which, which is amazing and uh, a lot of kudos to them. And this is Google, which is like a little bit more cautious, or like much more cautious actually. Um, so if you like a partnership manager of today, would you would you take Microsoft approach or would you take Google approach? Would you would you jump all in on AI? Would you try to apply to a different part of the program? Would you apply apply to different ways of doing partnerships? Like how would you think about it? If you if you're sort of in in, in partner head of partnership shoes, I'd want to know that every one of my partners and every person that works at my partner are different. When you get into the micro kind of um, personalization, I, I'd like to understand how open my partner is to having a co-pilot. So if they are open to it and I'm gonna be dealing maybe more with their digital co-pilot than I will with them as people, I'll wanna make sure that I have tools and processes and workflows and logic and obviously underlying technology that serves that means. If I have a partner who loves to go out for a drink, loves to go out to a golf course, look, I gotta serve my partner in the way my partner wants to learn, in the way my partner wants to be influenced, and the way my partner wants to be managed. So the first thing I'm gonna do with AI is try to figure out what camp on the spectrum of fully AI to fully golf course, where my partner individual is, and make sure as a partner manager, I'm respecting their view of the world, and I'm doing it better than my competitors will. And, and that's how I win. If you go all AI or if you go all golf course, you're going to lose 90% of your partner relationships. So it, it, I'm going to be wanting now, and as an analyst, I'm using ChatGPT every day. And I have big spreadsheets right now running in the background, you know, tapping into their API and answering questions for me at scale about the future of partner and getting to the data and stuff like that, that used to sit behind paywalls, that used to sit behind, you know, large manual tasks done by Fiverr, is all at our fingertips now. And we should all be innovating in the way we do our jobs and the way we execute partner relationships, the way we think about partner experience, the way we think about serving the customer's outcomes together. And again, whoever does that best, it's not your product price place or promotion that wins in the future. It's who intersects that piece is gonna win. I agree with you. I think hyper personalization is a big thing that you can be easily like achievable with AI, right? And it, it wasn't achievable before. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. My last question, just top of your head, who do you think would, would be sort of big winners and losers uh, in AI? slash partnerships or like in AI in general, maybe? AI is also a horizontal. There's not an AI company that's gonna win, it's a building block. So Einstein will be successful inside of Salesforce because Salesforce is the number one selling PRM worldwide. And the better they train Einstein, the better it's gonna work in that system. You know, Watson is gonna win within IBM. I mean. All the different companies have their own AI kind of strategies. Obviously, Microsoft's gone all in with open AI. Um, so it's going to be embedded as a part of it, not its own thing. One of the surprise winners of all this, though, is collecting the data lake of which the AI system can learn. One of the fallacies with ChatGPT, the version 3.5, is that it ended in 2021. It ended its learning. So anything that's happened in the last two years, it doesn't know. And so it will tell you it doesn't know because it ended its learning. But you've got to give it a big enough, rich enough, deep enough data lake to always be learning. And one of the surprise winners are going to be companies like Gong, who record every word you say. Literally your co-pilot. You know, combine that with Microsoft Office. Combining everything you write, everything you say, everything you listen to, literally 24-7, everything you dream about 
you know, soon in the future will be recorded. And if I could go into future interactions, and I've got a little sidebar here to our conversation right now, it interjects an email that I sent, you know, seven months ago on this topic. It's always in that Jeopardy sense, contextualizing what I'm talking about and serving up either new facts, serving up new ideas, bringing forward, you know, history. That co-pilot sense is going to be the winner. And the companies that can best funnel water into this data lake and get all of our lives recorded, at least from a business sense, are going to be the you know, really, really big IPOs and are going to be really well funded companies uh, into the future. Thanks so much. So we are unfortunately out of time and uh, uh, which um, opens an opportunity for us to have another conversation in a couple of months. I learned a lot today as well. And uh, thanks so much for, for, for sharing your insights. Thanks so much.